I'm going to mute everybody. Alex, please unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Habitat Now. I'm your host, Aaron Shea, and we'll be taking a glimpse into the artist world of Alex Bernstein. This is his 2040 celebration. He's been uh, graduated from art school for 20 years and working with glass for over 40. And we're honored to have him today. So Alex, jump in and say hello. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this social isolation has hit pretty hard. And so it's really nice to see a lot of friendly faces and see lots of friends. So I'm excited to be here. Um, the whole the 2040 idea uh, was supposed to be a little bit of a surprise, but Aaron already kind of told you the trick or the secret. So I've been doing glass since I was a, a kid and then um, been working with Habitat for almost 20 years and been a professional artist for almost 20 years. And the format of the talk is going to be a little bit different. I have filmed a video of me walking through my studio and part of my process. Uh, the, the sound wasn't very good, so I'm going to try to dub over it. So I'm going to be talking over my video. So I hope, um, I hope that goes smoothly. Um, I just thought that it would be better to have good sound. Uh, so I'll be talking over my video and then I'll be going into my slide presentation, which I will talk about how I make my work and then kind of a uh, history of me as a child growing up, uh, it'll be kind of chronological. And there are definitely, I would love to have some questions. Aaron, you said we'll stop for questions, is that right? Yep, I'll remind you as we, as we okay. grew, grew so that, through. That will be the format and uh, it, it usually starts a little slower and then I'm gonna pick up the pace as far as showing a lot of images. I'm gonna get to a point where I'll probably just show you a lot of, a lot of pictures because I like pretty pictures. So um, <laughs> there's, I have a little bit more to say of the earlier slides and so I'll try to keep a look at the clock. And so if you notice that I've only gone through five or six slides and we've been here for 20 minutes, don't worry, because I'll speed up. So uh, just um, let me know how things go, but I'll do my best to keep us on time as well. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. I want to let the YouTubers know who are missing today. Uh, thank you for joining us on this holiday. And then uh, like, subscribe, and hit that bell. We're trying to get our users up on YouTube. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I'll take over your screen first, and I'm going to show you a quick presentation. Alex put together of his studio, but I have a little bit of homework to do or a little bit of reporting to do first, and then Alex will take over the screen for his presentation. So first things first, I'm sharing my screen. Screen two, sharing my PowerPoint presentation and clickety-click. All right, welcome to Habitat Now. So I'm gonna give you a quick glimpse um, for the people who didn't come in for our masquerade exhibition. Just a quick little visit around the gallery before we get to Alex, just so you can see a little bit about the space and uh, you know, see what, what we had open last Saturday. There isn't really any audio to this, so just a quick, quick glimpse before we quickly move on. And we had a great turnout for this show uh, uh, last Saturday. People came in, wore their masks, it was all day. Everybody was quite safe, sold some things. So you guys are all welcome to come and see the space uh, anytime you're available to come around. How long is this? I'm gonna kind of Oh, look at that. Look at that piece right Ooh, there, Alex. That's a nice one. <laughs> Isn't that a beauty? That's the one behind me. It is a gorgeous piece. All right, we'll skip that. Um, reminder also, this upcoming Friday is the end of our auction. So 77 pieces all online. So feel free to place your bids. Call me with questions. All right, without further ado, this is Alex's uh, uh, work on our Glass 48 page. Piece is still available. And we'll go into Alex's tour. Ready, Alex? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. So this is uh, the, the video of the front of my studio. This is a former pool hall that was really lucky to find uh, that's just two miles outside of downtown Asheville. And I was able to take this old pool hall. You can see the sign right there. It says Sharkies um, and renovate it into my studio. So uh, unfortunately, when I photographed this, it was a little bit of a cloudy, rainy day. But this is just a look at some of the work. Uh, this is a piece that's featured in the Habitat International show. Uh, this is Sorry, moving a little fast. Uh, this is just some uh, clean work. I don't really have a gallery in my studio, but I have to have a place to put my clean work. And I finished work. This is a series of stack pieces that I did. People might not be as familiar with my wall pieces. Oh, that must be Nest. This piece is called Nest, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually pretty nice in the video because it's really a piece that uh, really needs to be walked around. Um, so I think I was trying to show you what it's like to walk around the piece. Um, and again, here's more of my wall pieces. Uh, Habitat showed those a few years ago and it's always uh, some of my favorites. 
And again, walking through my studio, um, I tell people that I have the largest collection in the world of Alex Bernstein glass. So I'm pretty honored to have that. Um, this is some of the new work that I've been making during COVID, uh, some of these stack pieces. And I kind of put them in there almost like a jewel box. Such I think. amazing colors, man. Those are beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I feel really, really lucky to be able to come to my studio every day and be surrounded by all this beautiful uh, glowing glass. Um, I'm also super crit critical. So everything I see, I'm like, well, should I do this? Should I do that? Um, I've been doing a lot of pairs. I don't know if you know diptychs where there's two sculptures together. Uh, this is a mixture of some of my older work and newer work. So here I'm showing you, I have three separate studios and this is my kiln room. So I melt glass, I'm, I'm holding the raw materials. In my hand right now is bullseye glass. I'm also wearing a bullseye t-shirt, if you notice that, it's from Portland, <laughs> Oregon. Uh, so these are called billets. So they're blocks of glass. And then I'm gonna show you what's called frit, which is basically small, um, it's kind of like the, the size of corn kernels. And I use the two uh, different types of glass, billets, and uh, the frit to get different textures in the glass. Um, and it makes different effects depending on if I use a billet or if I use the frit. Um, right at this day when I was filming, I happened to be firing an oven. So the glass goes into this oven, 1,550 degrees, the glass melts. Actually, this is lead crystal, so it's 1,450 degrees and it melts. Um, Right after this talk, I'm gonna show some images of my process. So I'm gonna go back over this a little bit. So if you're missing some of it, don't worry, I'm gonna go back over it. Um, basically here, I'm saying that this is my cold shop where I cut and grind and sculpt the glass. This is really where the creative side comes in. Um, I'm really like a stone sculptor where I cut and carve. So this is a, a mass removal a wheel that um, removes a lot of uh, material. And I have these kind of cone wheels and then this, I'm saying that I can bring it, um, the glass all the way from really, really rough, all the way up to really high, smooth polish. And so this is just a view of my cold shop. And it's technically, it's not cold, but they call it a cold shop because it's where you manipulate the shape of glass without using heat. Um, in here, I do my Bernstein technique. Of people that aren't familiar with Bernsteining, what I do is I literally am grinding sparks onto the glass and it sticks. And again, I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about that. So here's me. Uh, trust me, I usually wear more safety equipment when I'm doing this. Don't <laughs> I was worry. gonna ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I did this just for, just for a minute for the camera. So I'm actually applying the steel. If you look closely, you'll see a little bit of gray on the glass um, and that's the fused steel. So gotcha. now I guess we're out of this and I'm gonna... Yeah, we'll kick over to you. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And uh, thank you, Alex, for sharing the videos. You're welcome to take over the screen and give everybody a glimpse of your uh, presentation, which is gonna be great. Okay. I really thought, yeah, I was, when I saw you grinding the glass, I really thought you definitely needed a mask for that, I would uh, assume. So I'm glad you're, you do that more often. Screen share, yeah, I, uh, safety first always. <laughs> sure. Go. Let me go ahead and press the play button. We can see your screen. Make sure you're on the first slide and voila. Okay. Does everybody see this okay? Click the button. Yep, we're good. Okay, so I mix things up. I've, I've given my slide talk quite a few times and maybe some of you have heard it. Um, every time I do it, I want something new and different. So I took some slides out, added some, um, and this is my how-to. And often I'll put how I make my work kind of at the very end. But since in the video, we are already talking about it, I thought I should start with this. So I'm gonna start with this and then get more into my chronological history. So again, this is the process. This is a, um, I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually a fire extinguisher that's cut in half and I have glass in it. Um, because really I'm like a stone sculptor, so I don't really care what the original shape's gonna be because I'm gonna cut and sculpt it into something. Does that make sense? So fire extinguisher, there's glass in it, and then it goes into an oven at, and it melts at 1550 degrees. True story, I actually lost my insurance policy from my studio because of this image. This is actually not my studio. I was borrowing a friend's studio and I took a picture. Somehow my insurance agent saw this picture <laughs> on my website and literally canceled my insurance policy because he saw this kiln. It's true that this kiln is, um, is what I would call old school. It's not the safest kind of kiln, but I just thought it was really interesting that an insurance adjuster would literally look at websites and-, and find you anywhere. I know, it's really funny. So um, again, this is the, the, all the glass is melting together, homogenizes into one block. This is 1550 degrees. 
and this would have to cool really slowly. These pieces probably were cooling um, for probably at least two weeks. So it has to cool really, really slowly. Oh, it did not let me. It's not letting me go forward for some reason. Okay. Okay, so this is, uh, once it comes out of the oven and it's cooled, uh, I, I do a drawing on it. So again, like a stone sculptor, I try to see what kind of sculpture is inside the glass. So I'm trying to draw out what the pattern is going to be. And this is actually one of my older pieces that um, we'll show you, but it, it still should make sense. So here's the drawing of what I want. Hmm. Well, sorry. <clears throat> and this is me cutting out the shape, so kind of fabricating it. And then I'm grinding the shape out. Here's it's partially ground. And you can see this is my old studio. Um, talk about cold shop. This had this studio had no heat at all. So it was literally very cold in the wintertime there. So this is I'm um, cutting uh, the um, the texture and kind of the feathers in the saw. So this one, I'm actually holding the piece into the saw blade. Uh, sometimes I'll do the opposite. I'll bring the saw blade to the piece. And here I'm grinding the sculpture flat. Here's just another view of my studio. So the piece is partially made. In this, I'm masking the piece off. So people that don't know, again, there's a technique of applying steel to the surface of the glass that nowadays is called bernsteining. Obviously, it's my um, last name. So I've, I've become somewhat of a verb, or at least one of my <laughs> techniques as a verb. Um, but what this enabled me to do is to have opacity mixed with the translucency of my glass. So I mask it off, and then I literally grind sparks onto the glass. And you can see how that's starting to turn opaque. Uh, there's a little bit of gray. And then this is the finished piece. So mm -hmm. if I can That's beautiful. Back. So you can see the whole piece is this blue color. And then I'm able to grind, mask it off, fuse the steel, and then it turns into this opaque. So this whole piece is glass. The steel is just the fused steel, the burn staining on the bottom. Beautiful. And again, if we, uh, Aaron, what's the format for questions? We have questions at the end or? Yeah, we can stop right now. If anybody has any questions, I got one from some, from Bandu asked if you re, re anneal after carving your uh, glass sculptures. I'm assuming that's a no, but. Uh, Good question. Uh, but I anneal things for a ridiculous amount of time. So people that don't know annealing, annealing is cooling the glass and you have to cool it slowly. Uh, because the molecules don't like if you cool it really fast. So um, I have to cool it really slowly so the glass is happy. Uh, but for my process, since I'm so rough and I cut and I carve and I'm very aggressive on the glass, I have to anneal it usually for twice of what most people would do it. So um, even a small piece is in the oven for probably 120 hours, no, 180 hours. And then some of my larger pieces, uh, we're talking two months. And so again, I basically, whatever bullseye and different glass companies have programs, and I almost always double it. Um, Got any question. other questions Got or should question I keep moving? Yep, someone asked, uh, Annie asked, do you sandblast the glass also? Good question, I do. I sandblast the glass first, just so it's uh, not sharp. Uh, because I'm cutting, I'm carving, I literally use a chisel to chisel away the glass. And so I sandblast it not as a, um, not as a technique to get texture, which you can use it for texture, but I sandblast it uh, just so it's not sharp. Great, great. And then I had a question and it yep. might be more technical than how sure. I pronounce it, but is there a favorite color you like to use? Maybe it's an easier glass. Maybe it's just something you love to use. You dabble in so many beautiful colors and tones. I, I, yeah, I don't know if I have a favorite. I tend to be drawn to uh, blues and greens. Uh, bullseye glass has this neodymium that uh, I'm going to show you several different images of work with that. Um, and I developed this method of mixing colors together, this neodymium and uh, aqua green, and it makes this amazing blue. And the blue actually doesn't really exist on its own. You can't buy the color, but if you mix the two glasses, um, you get this amazing color. And as you guys can see from this slide, this is me at age seven or eight. And the fact that I got to grow up around glass. I mean, glass, as you guys all know, you love glass, most everybody here. It's really like magic. And like 
I was talking about this, my favorite color, this neodymium, it literally, like, no, I'm not exaggerating, it literally changes colors depending on what kind of light. It goes from blue to purple. In the video, <laughs> there was this really bright pink pieces, but it actually changes to green because it's the same neodymium. So truly, I really believe glass is like magic. Um, and again, this is me at my parents' studio. I think I was seven or eight. And you can't really see, but there's actually a flame. Can you, oh, can you do that? Can you see my cursor here? Yes. Can everybody see that? Okay. So there's actually a flame. This is like a Bunsen burner and there's a flame and I'm literally melting two pieces of glass together. I'm a father of an eight year old myself and I would never in a hundred years put him anywhere <laughs> near an open flame. I'm shocked that my parents did this and it's a miracle I was never hurt. But, this, is what, um, so, this, is what, this is what parenting was like back in the day. Remember? Yes. So if you're doing the math and the title of my talk was 2040. Um, so the, this is the 40 part. So I've technically been working with glass for 40 years because this is me at age eight. That's and cool. the 20 part is graduate school is just around 20 years ago. And that's I'd worked with galleries before that and done kind of as a professional, but I use that as is where I uh, decide that that's when I started to be a professional artist. Uh, Alex, got a question for you real quick. Have you yep. ever combined burn seeding with gold leafing or silver leafing onto the glass from Anthony? I've done gold leafing and silver leafing. I've used other kind of metals. Um, and actually you guys have a client that is an engineer, um, maybe he's on the call. Um, that developed stainless steel and I've done it with stainless steel, but, um, I haven't tried a whole lot of things other what I use is really just mild steel. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna get going. This is um, my mother's piece. So again, that was my parents' studio. This is uh, my mother, Catherine Bernstein. This is cast optical crystal. And uh, my mom was a sculptor and Harvey Littleton took one of her uh, ceramic sculptures and took it to his studio and turned it into lead crystal, a glass sculpture. Back then, um, not that many people used glass. And as people know with Harvey Littleton, he really like, I don't know if he was the Pied Piper, but he really wanted people to use glass as an artistic material. And it's really a true story. He took one of my mom's castings, or took one of her clay pieces and turned it into a casting and said, you should be doing glass. Uh, it turns out later that actually John Littleton um, said that he actually did the casting. Harvey took it and gave it to John and said, do this <laughs> casting for Katie. So, um, but Harvey really uh, helped encourage artists to work with glass. And I, you know, obviously literally grew up in the American studio glass movement. Um, important thing about my mom is she, I think her work is very sincere. She makes work about what's important to her. And this is me with my babysitter. So as a kid, she would say stillsies, which meant I had to hold still and she would draw us. And um, I just like the idea of making work about everyday events. You know, everybody, uh, finds their source from different inspiration. And I like that my mom's work's very sincere. It's about her day-to-day -day life. Uh, this is a collaborative piece that we made together. This is actually in the collection of um, the Imagine Museum in St. Pete, Florida. Uh, so my mom did the, the head and I did the carving. Uh, this is about kind of coming through. Uh, there, there's this tunnel that the person's walking through. This is actually about uh, a, a friend of my mother's who was really sick and went through treatments for her illness. So it was about coming through. Uh, this is one of my father's pieces. So this is all a William Bernstein. This is all cane drawn. This is actually a self portrait that he did. And so cane drawn means he actually, there's no paint. He's using the color, colored glass to melt it into the form. And this, you reheat it. Um, you know, hundreds of times and you can spend all day at the furnace reheating the glass and melting it in. This is my parents' collaborative work. Uh, so these are wine goblets. These were sold at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City. They basically paid for both my brother and I's college. Um, but this was kind of my first lesson in production. Um, if you guys know production work or uh, like utilitarian work, that's something that you can use. So wine glasses, they'd get an order for two dozen, they would make them. Uh, so when I first started glass, I thought, this is my work, I thought that I had to come up with a line and sell it. So this was one of my first lines of production. And it really did not take me long before I really, really did not like what I was doing. It was painful. I got orders for this and then I had to recreate everything. And it just wasn't fun to make the same thing over and over. And honestly, if I look back now, I probably wasn't that good. And so it made it even more challenging. So this was my first production work. 
it really didn't take long before I started making more um, one of a kind pieces. So this was one of my first vases. Uh, the studio is uh, really very close to this beautiful river. Um, and so I'd go and get river stones and then I started incorporating the stones into my sculptures. Uh, this is a larger piece. Uh, this is probably like three feet tall. And actually, I'm not sure if you can see there's one of the versions behind me sitting here uh, that's a little bit of a smaller. So I'm showing you just a glimpse. I probably made, you know, 20 or so of these. Um, and again, this is right after undergrad. Uh, and then I went to graduate school in Rochester, New York at RIT and is not really known for the architecture. Um, <laughs> these buildings are just these kind of big, ugly squares. Um, it was a harsh reality. I was born and raised in, in North Carolina and didn't really know what real winter time was and didn't know what real isolation was. I mean, it was a very intense experience. Graduate school, I think it's their job to poke holes in everything you do and basically kind of um, knock you down and then rebuild you. So it was, uh, I wouldn't say easy experience, but a very um, enriching one. Again, Rochester, New York. At that time, I'd really studied glass blowing, this Venetian style of glass blowing, which is technically very challenging. Um, I'm a bit of an athlete, and I think I like the physical aspect that I wanted to be really good at glass blowing, and I wanted to be better than everybody at glass blowing. Um, this is a shallow bowl, which is one of the most challenging uh, shapes you can make. So making this beautiful shallow bowl and I would turn these in for assignments and projects and people say, so what? It's a shallow bow. Who cares? What's your idea? And so I was going through this, this frustration. Everything I made uh, was on the crutch of glass blowing. Every assignment, I go, well, I'll do something glass blowing. And I, I could realize that the frustration that glass blowing, I didn't have that much to say. It's a bowl. How does this look any different than something that you'd buy at Ikea? No offense to Ikea. So this frustration started to even boil over. And again, every single assignment I had, I would try to do the assignment with glass blowing. It's my crutch, I'm good at it, I can do it. So this piece was actually a perfectly made uh, cylinder. I made it, you know, went through all the work of making it perfect. And then as it was hot, took this copper wire and kind of strung it out and pulled it together. Literally, and I think in a critique at one point, a professor said, oh, you're really trying to kill the vessel, aren't you? And I think this almost looks literal, like I was really trying to kill it. And really what it was is cognitive dissonance in my head. I was just trying to go, well, I know that glass blowing doesn't say everything that I want to say. And so I need to work through it. Um, right around that time, I was lucky enough to go to the Czech Republic and meet Franišek Janak, who was a glass uh, caster. And he also uh, was a student of Professor Lubinsky. And most of you guys probably know that in the Czech Republic, um, they're masters of glass casting. And that's kind of where the art of glass casting started. So again, I was lucky enough to go to the Czech Republic and I met Franišek Janak. And then it turned out that he was, the next semester was gonna be a visiting professor at RIT where I taught. So I basically, shoulder to shoulder got the experience of learning from a Czech master directly, directly from um, Professor Lubinsky, the style of casting. When I was in the Czech Republic, I was blown away by this idea that um, thick glass or cast glass has almost like an aura. It kind of really just glows from within and all the blown work I was doing almost looked like plastic. So I was really excited that now I had a voice where I could talk about my sculptures more thoroughly when I couldn't really do it in glass blowing. I still like to blow glass for the fun of it, um, but I couldn't really, I didn't really feel like I had much to say. Um, this is a sculpture that's actually in the permanent collection of the Corning Museum of Glass. It's uh, called Betty's Fight, and it's again about um, a friend of my mother's who was uh, kind of suffering from cancer and kind of corroding and, and rotting and she was balancing. And so I made this piece about her. And again, it's in the Corning Museum and there's a little statement about this woman, Betty Oliver, who I made it, who actually was an amazing poet from New York City and a dear friend of my parents. So um, as a maker, as somebody that makes objects, you know, why do I make them? And when I realize how much joy and Betty Oliver's family would go to the museum and see this, it just makes it that much more satisfying that what I'm doing uh, can be important, whether it's just to look pretty in somebody's house, that's perfectly fine with me as well. Um, but, but I felt like I really had something to say.
Uh, this piece is called Slate. Uh, there was these parks in um, outside of Rochester that looked, I think they called them the, the Grand Canyons of the East Coast. So there's these walls of slate and then there's this beautiful river. So you can see I'm kind of doing abstract work, um, but, but similar to my mom, I would go out and have an experience and then try to make my artwork about what I saw. And it wasn't like literally, it wasn't I went to the park and then I made this the next day. It took quite a while, but this piece was based abstractly against these parks in Rochester. Uh, this is called Amber Wedge. And this piece is uh, where I started to really do heavy subtraction, where I was really taking away a lot of material from the sculpture. So this was almost a black piece of glass. And then as I carved it, almost like this sunset just appeared. I was carving it and then I was like, whoa, like the suns, it was just black. And I really I was intrigued by this idea of really carving to remove material. Uh, I bring this, brought this one, I didn't used to show this one, but um, as a child, always been interested in geodes and stones. And people that are familiar with my current work will know that I talk about these natural crystals and some of my kind of circles almost look like crystals. Well, this is a piece that's almost 20 years old and it's my start of this idea of these geodes. So this is my fused steel on the surface and then I kind of polished the edge to make it look like a, um, some sort of natural crystal. The uh, practice of me going back and putting the slide talk together actually was really um, fulfilling and exciting because I was looking heavily at, at past work I'd done and then realized that virtually everything I've done, I was recycling old ideas and going back and forth, which is really, I, I enjoyed this process. Right out of graduate school, I got a job at the Cleveland Inst Institute of Art. Uh, my mother was thrilled, yay, he got a job. She was really <laughs> excited that I, uh, got a job and then, you know, obviously when you get a graduate degree in art, uh, you wonder what you're going to do with that. So I thought right away that um, to support myself, I wanted to be an academic. So this is the Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, I'm a maker. I love using my hands to make things. So as soon as I got there, um, I started making, uh, but like my mother, I made work that was about my everyday experience. Uh, I was teaching a 2D, 3D uh, design class. And in 2D, 3D design, um, there's a lot of design principles. I guess you guys are all muted. So you, I usually ask people to yell things out, but um, I'll do it for you. So in this piece, again, I was teaching these classes about design, about um, different elements. And in, in this piece, there's proximity there's balance because you can see the two windows and then there's line. You can see vertical line and horizontal lines. So I was making this piece and I was thinking about my students. I was thinking about what I was teaching. I was thinking about my everyday experience. And also Corey and Aaron, I think this was um, one of the first pieces at the Habitat International. Um, I should probably say that I'm obviously honored and thrilled to be part of the Habitat family. And this I was, was the very, first piece. Yeah, this was the first piece, right? Yep. yep. And I don't, I need to look back on the exact date, but I know that I've been represented and part of it. And it really does feel like a family. When I say the Habitat family, I'm not just saying that, it really truly feels like a family. And I was, you know, thrilled at um, 16, 18 years ago to have this piece included in the, in, in the International. And then it sold and then they said, how about next year? Let's be in the International. And then, you know, we've been friends and family ever since. Um, so that's just a little note. But again, making work about my everyday experiences. Um, I also should say uh, thank you to the American Craft Council. I was given a grant to buy optical lead crystal. So you notice at this point, all my glass is clear and that's because of this uh, grant from the American Craft Council. Thank you very much. And starting out as a glass artist, uh, the materials are very, very expensive. So it can be pros pro cost prohibitive to even make some of this stuff. So it was really amazing for me. Um, and when you use this optical crystal, there's, there's this inside. When I had colored work, it's kind of, there's you know the front, the back, and the sides, and maybe it glowed from the middle. But with the optical lead crystal, you can use the inside because it's so clear. And so it's almost like the fifth element. Uh, this piece is called Memories. And I put this up again, speaking of friends and family, um, this piece uh, was donated um, by Jerry Silverstein, who recently passed away. And I just wanted to put this in here to kind of honor his memory. Um, I met Jerry and his partner, Bob Zimmerman, 
almost 18 years ago and they have been dear friends and he, uh, Jerry bought this piece from one of the very first shows I had in Chicago. Um, and now he donated it to the, I always get the name wrong, Bergstrom Mahler Museum in Michigan. So uh, again, Wisconsin. talking about family and why we all do this, it's, it's about you guys. I mean, you're all collectors and family and friends and it's just, it means so much to know where my work is going and, and know who has it and then be able to be friends. You know, I've stayed with Jerry and Bob at their house and um, anyway, I just wanted to everybody just take a second to think about Jerry in this piece. Um, but also this idea that there's this inside. So this is one of the first where I was really, I was cutting things, melting it back together to get these lines and patterns in the, in the glass. It's a beauty. Thank you. Uh, so again, with the inside, this piece is called Solid Empty. And this is a block of glass. It's probably a 40 pound block of optical lead crystal. And I'm gonna try to do this again. So if you touch this part, it's this solid block of glass. It looks almost like it's an open vessel, but that's just this optical crystal. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a solid piece. And the cut, the texture is that I cut on the sides and you actually look at this tunnel. You can be transported. So this is the exploration that I did with um, this optical lead crystal. The process of polishing optical lead crystal is, uh, it takes a long time, a laborious kind of process of hours and hours and hours. And what I found, uh, this, this piece of glass here was about two inches thick. And when you polish a block of glass that's two inches thick, and then you set it down and look through it, guess what you see? You see right through it. Hmm. And so I was working on the sculpture and I, I spent, I think a month polishing it perfectly, perfectly the whole piece. And then I said it in my studio, I remember this, I left my studio and I looked back behind me and I looked at the pedestal where the sculpture was and I couldn't see it. It disappeared. <laughs> and the reason it disappeared is because it was polished and it was clear and you see right through it. I realized that I couldn't see the form very well. And I went back and I took my 25 grit wheel, which is one of the roughest wheels I have. And I reground. So I'm talking about this whole surface here. I yeah. reground. So now you can see the shape. This was kind of this breakthrough that I had. Um, and also, I, I think it's important not to do or be a cop out from techniques that you don't like. I don't like being lazy. I like to work really, really hard. But if I'm not passionate about my process, then my work's not going to show my passion either. So I feel like it's important to try to balance. Um, do you love your process? Do you enjoy it? I think those are important things. So at this point, I wasn't enjoying the process of, of trying to polish the glass. So I went back and ground it. But also what it did is this is the side, so the, it, it had that stairway. And so this stairway became way more um, apparent and dramatic because now it was in the side instead of just being able to see through the piece. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's gorgeous. Okay. After that, this is optical lead crystal. This is, um, I'm not using it optically at all. This piece uh, was made, um, to kind of as a tribute to Cleveland as a steel town. And then also there's these metro parks. And I used to go running in the metro parks and it turns out it's really cold in Cleveland. Anybody been to Cleveland? It gets <laughs> very cold there. Uh, and there was these waterfalls in the metro parks and guess what, they freeze. And so this was called ice fall because this little waterfall I used to run by, sure enough was frozen, you know, it seemed like six months out of the year. So I made this piece, but also optically, um, I wasn't using this lead crystal as optic at all, but I was enjoying what I was doing. So I think that's important. Okay, I'm gonna try to pick the pace up a little bit. I don't wanna keep you guys too long. So um, right out after Cleveland, I got a job at the Massachusetts, oh, excuse me. I got a job at the Worcester Center of Crafts in, in Massachusetts. And this was as a department head to run a brand new program that they had just started. So I packed up my bags and I moved to Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I didn't know anyone at all and they had no kilns to work with. So I couldn't melt the glass together at all. But um, I don't take, you know, really any excuses just because I don't have a kiln. I'm again, like I said, I love what I do and I have to make things. And so what I did have is I had a block of these billets, which are basically, um, I think they're roughly eight by 10 blocks of glass. And I started to fabricate them into these little sculptures. Um, and some of the, the students where I was working, saw this and they said, oh, Alex is making little friends. So he has somebody to talk to. Cause honestly, <laughs> I didn't really have any friends in Massachusetts. And I think I really literally some, sometimes would talk to these little sculptures as I was working on them. Um, these are all, again, they're maybe 12 inches tall. Um, but what this taught me 
is is a lot of skill in sculpting these pieces. It looked friendly. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a clo close up. This was a bellows piece. This is another just individual sculpture. Um, I was really kind of interested in making a monumental sculpture in feel that is small in scale. Glass is the kind of material that if you make anything out of glass and you make it really, really big, it's going to be very impressive. But the trick is, or at least, you know, in my opinion, the trick is if you can make something really, really impressive, like this piece that feels like it's really big, but it's actually small in scale, that's the challenge. So I would, I love to give myself uh, personal challenges and assignments. And so I was trying to make these monumental feeling pieces, but they're really small scale. Aaron, you remember all these? I kind of remember them. Yeah, I remember the bellows. <laughs> I'm sure Corey does. So there for a while, this is, this is what I had and this is what I showed. Um, but I really feel like I learned a lot. Um, and I love learning, so it's perfect. I finally got some kilns working. This is a dip dip, so it's a group of two. And I really like how they were talking to each other. So uh, I think I had got a small kiln working at this time. And then the larger kilns started working. Uh, this is called Coral. I think it's about, it was, I think maybe 24 by 30. This is called Monocot. I think it was 33 inches tall. Right around that time, speaking of materials, um, Lonnie McGregor, who owns Bullseye Glass, or is one of the owners of Bullseye Glass Company, said, you should be using our glass. And I said, Lonnie, I can't afford your glass. And at that time, and it still is, about $10 a pound, um, which is kind of like the price of cof coffee. So glass is not that inexpensive. As, um, it was a great expense to me at that time. When I said, Lonnie, I can't afford your glass. And literally a month later, a pallet of Bullseye Glass showed up at my studio. So I was able to work with um, this beautiful bullseye glass. And what bullseye glass does is it enables me to mix different colors together. Um, there's a long story about why you can't mix all colors together, but I'll, I'll skip that for today or we can leave it to the end. Uh, but this enabled me to mix different colors. You can see the subtle color change. Um, this piece is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, so I'm skipping, that was about three years that I was in Massachusetts. So obviously I'm not gonna show you a bunch of images of everything I made there, but that's just a example. Um, and then I was able after Massachusetts to move to Asheville, North Carolina. Sorry, let me move somebody, there we go. Right. We good? Okay, yep. Asheville, North Carolina, which was my hometown. I grew up about an hour away from this. And as a lot of good stories go, uh, I met a girl. I met my wife, Jessica Bernstein. And in Massachusetts, she actually got a job as a city planner in Asheville. And she said, oh, hey, there's a job in Asheville as a city planner, what do you think? And of course, you guys know how the story ends. Um, <laughs> we ended up moving to Asheville and, and got married and it's people that haven't been here. I know a lot of people have visited my studio and been here. Um, it's a very, very pretty place to be. Um, it's a lovely little town and it's filled with artists and I'm really excited that I get to live here. Uh, this is my studio. Like I said before, I, I bought this old, or Jessica and I bought this old pool hall, and but we were able to hire an architect and kind of renovate it into exactly the space that I needed. Um, this was, I think, pretty soon right after renovation, so you can see it's nice and new and clean there. Um, <laughs> there's no ping pong played anymore at first. Before I had a kid, uh, I used to play ping pong with Hayden, my assistant. Um, that table is now just a storage table. Uh, Jessica and I bought a new house and our neighbor's daughter was selling bulbs to raise money for her school. And I was looking at these flower bulbs and I was just blown away that these beautiful flowers grow right out of these bulbs. So I started this series of uh, these seed pod pieces. And again, they're abstract works. So I don't want it to look exactly, but this idea of this growth and movement from what I saw as our little neighbor, Helena, was selling these little bulbs. Um, and again, I made Lots of different colors, lots of different sizes, but this is still probably one of my favorite series. Um, and again, you can see it kind of opening up to me is almost like a stone burst where um, the glass was bursting out of a stone or it's a seed pod. You know, obviously it's abstract work so people can bring their own experiences. Those bases, those are glass too though, right? They're just covered. Yeah, the entire piece is glass. And so just like when I showed you the slides in the start, um, the whole piece is glass, it's carved and sculpted. And then the, um, the steel is is applied to just the, the outside that I want. And then I can patina that later. And I actually think I have a video of me patinaing it. Um, 
So this is bullseye glass, the mixing of the glass. There's the same idea of a growing. You can see almost like vines growing up the side. And then before, if I was talking about the lead crystal with the inside, I was kind of exploiting that inside with a flash of color in the middle. This is another from that series of the bullseye glass. And again, uh, these window pieces, um, you know, I don't know how many I made, but I, I kind of still currently make those. And actually, you guys may be have some of these, Aaron, still. Um, I always kind of liked the, the move and, and flow of this one. Um, so then life happens. Uh, this is Max Elias Bernstein. He's going to be uh, 9, November 23rd. And as you guys know, life doesn't always go the road that you may plan it. So uh, three days, well, actually two days after Max was born, he had a massive stroke. He had um, so a, basically a brain bleed. And so, you know, one minute we have this beautiful baby boy and then, you know, the next thing we know, um, we're about to lose him. And so it was, you know, obviously a traumatic experience, but something that, you know, that's life and you just have to do the best you can. This is uh, Max right before he was taken. He was flown to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is um, they have a neurosurgeon that specializes in little babies. I mean, he's, you know, like two days old at this point. Uh, this is a helicopter taking him. And that feeling of a father, something, you know, Jessica and I, not to get too deep, but had wished and hoped and dreamed for a child for many, many years. And then finally we had this child and then to see him fly away in a helicopter was certainly a horrifying experience. Um, but it ends happy. We, um, you know, from, flying away, not knowing if I was ever going to see this child again, um, to living happy. He still loves the beach. He is, um, I would say, uh, profoundly disabled. He, um, physical disability, he's not able to walk and, and needs a wheelchair, but he is smart as a whip and funny and cracks jokes and is just an amazing kid to be around. Um, I think the important thing is, you know, you're working, you're making your career, but really ultimately like what I was saying about Jerry and what I was saying about all you is um, relationships, family, is really, is really the important thing. I thought it was interesting also that um, being a maker, after coming through a traumatic experience, the work that I kind of went back to is more of a stoic work. So this is my lead crystal work, um, which again, I think some of these are at Habitat Gallery, where I have these almost like these growth lines in it. Um, and I guess this was made right after Max was born and to not make bright, colorful work. I don't think I even thought about it. I just started making this work. And then now looking back, I'm like, oh, that's right. I made more quiet, stoic work after Max. And also just being a father and not sleeping. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, This is a diptych. So this is two together. Again, you can see these growth lines, which is something that I'm using still on my current work. So these are blocks that are melted together. And I want it to look as if they're growing. And then this is a grouping and I would actually have to thank Aaron because Aaron actually put this together. I didn't think that I, um, I didn't plan on grouping these together. And then um, Aaron at one day said, oh, hey, I put all your crystal pieces together in a group and took an image of it for you. And I saw and I said, wow, that's amazing as a group. So this is going to lead to my more current work that I'm going to show you in a minute. So just put a bookmark here and remember that um, the grouping together. They are intended to be separate pieces. And then thank you, Aaron. Aaron grouped these all together, which is going to lead to some, what I'm working on currently. Um, so this is a look at um, what I'm inspired by, some of my inspiration. Again, uh, I take insp the inspiration from, from growth and things growing. This is one of my pieces literally outside uh, in the rain rusting. So my work obviously is about nature. And um, the fact is, is the rusty steel is a natural phenomenon. So my work actually is about nature, but it, a lot of it, or at least the work with steel is going through a natural phenomenon. So this is the finished piece. And then here I have a video, I'm gonna see if it works. So if you can look, the, the steel, this is a steel section, is gray. And then if the video works, watch the color of the steel. So this is actually rusting the steel. And this is no tricks. I'm not cutting it. This is actually live exactly what happened. Do you see how it turns red, pink? Mm, yeah. This is copper sulfite. And so this is how I get the, the rusty look of the piece. This is hurrying. I also, as you, I showed you before, I can put it outside in the rain. 
So I put it outside in the rain, or do you want to see this one more time? I'm going to play it one more. Um, so it's gray, and then it starts to rust. Hmm. And again, I just feel like glass is, is like magic. Um, I can make my sculptures look like wood or like stone or, or like anything. I really um, think it's an amazing, amazing material to work with. So here's the finished piece. Wow. It's amazing. Thank you. Uh, more inspiration. This is St. Lucia. So again, just the colors of the sunset. This is Mexico. And yes, again, Max loves the beach. So we tend to get to the beach as often as possible. With Corona, we haven't been able to go as much as we would like, but um, we still do. Again, the sunset in Mexico. So I'm gonna pick up the pace just a little bit. Are we doing okay on time? Yeah, we're doing fine. Okay. No rush at all. Uh, so one of my favorite pieces, this is, again is in the Imagine Museum in St. Pete, Florida. So uh, it's not like I looked at the piece of coral and said, I want to make a piece just like it, but I think it's part of my memory and part of my history that sculptures like this evolve through seeing that. Um, this is the Dolomite Mountains in Italy. This is a Monet painting. And again, I'm not, I really don't think that I'm Monet. But this is uh, this idea of this pointillism. And if you see the color here, it looks kind of like Starry Night. Um, you can see the colors. This piece is at Habitat Gallery. But it's almost like a painter. I take these glass pieces that I was showing you before and I mix them together and really can almost kind of um, make a composition like a painter would with the different colors. So the, the Northern Lights. So this is Aaron to answer your question. This is one of my favorite colors. Um, That's a beauty. Thank you. I see the tones change around the piece on the edges. Is that your mixing color of bullseye glass or how does that happen? Exactly. This is where I was talking about where uh, the blue color that you see here actually doesn't exist. It's a mixing of the green that's on the edge and this neodymium purple on the outside. Hmm. And when they mix, they make this inside blue. And again, you can see the blue here. You know, I can't go to Bullseye and say, send me some of that blue. They don't have the blue. It just, by accident, I developed the color and um, by do they, color do they, mixing. Do they have you on their payroll to develop the stuff for yeah, them? I think so. <laughs> it's my secret. By the way, nobody tell anyone. Just um, how, do you, so, how do you create those bubbles? That's a good question. Uh, the bubbles come because I'm using this frit. And the frit, again, is like corn kernel size pieces. And when it melts together, air gets trapped. Let's see, this one's a good example. Air gets trapped. And what happens when the air gets trapped is it forms bubbles. And what the bubbles do is they catch the light and they make the piece uh, sparkle and glow. I can do pieces that don't have bubbles or bubble free, but I find using them selectively and using them in the way I want, I can really, um, manipulate the light and the color. So these little bubbles and the reason they're all very similar shape is it's because the bullseye frit is all the same size. Uh, again, Northern light. So here's the frit again, sorry. I hope that answers your question. So this is actually a billet and then some frit that goes around it. And a crystal. This is some sort of jade. Really, this is one of my favorite colors. This green is just amazing. It's very vivid. Yeah. When, Textures, you're, uh, when you're carving the glass and you're, you're cutting stuff away, is it possible to reuse the carving parts or are they just all gone after you're done? Uh, some, uh, a lot of it's not always worth my time mm -hmm. um, because I, uh, the compatibility issues with glass, if, it, if it's not compatible, then the glass can break. So um, if I get some uh, material that's not the right kind of glass, then it can make the piece break. Gotcha. So, uh, but some of it I'll reuse stuff, but, but not too much. Uh, so this is just texture in the sand. So texture in the piece. That's a, so, big, that's a uh, larger piece than it looks, right? It's like 36 inches or something. Yeah, this is a big one. It's probably about 100 pounds. Uh, this is actually borosilicate glass, which is a different type of glass. Uh, so it technically actually could be outside. Here's mountains in Italy, lakes. So this series, thinking about landscapes, uh, this is more of a landscape piece. And uh, thinking, again, it's abstract, so I don't want it to look exactly like a lake, but this is what I was thinking about, kind of mountain lakes. 
Your work is very know. calming. I feel really relaxed right now. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm going to drink some coffee right now, so I'm not too relaxed. It's great. Um, the Dolomite Mountains, uh, again, in Italy, it's a little hard to tell, but these are just massive mountains. There's actually a building in here that it's hard to see. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel to the Dolomites to do a cycling race uh, with a friend of mine that lives in Germany. And I was on his, his team. So this is pieces that I made uh, from that series that I intended to look like uh, the mountains. So again, this one, you can see a construction um, <clears throat> tower here and uh, the mountains are just massive. So I was on the cycling team and I was doing this event and I was on, I was a visiting cyclist or a visiting teammate for my friend's uh, German team. And we were doing this race and the whole time it was through the Dolomites. I kept going, look at that, look at this, look how pretty, look how amazing. And uh, this is my bad German. He was like, shut up, Alex, keep pedaling. Stop looking around, just keep pedaling. Uh, because I was just blown away by the scene. And obviously the cycling event was very challenging and difficult, but I was like, we have to go back. I have to study this and look at this. Um, it's hard to tell in pictures, but this, um, they're just amazing. They look like sculptures, but they're the landscape. I, it I was really blown away. It's not that often that I have this acute view where I travel somewhere and then I immediately have to go back and start making work about it. Um, this is from my Dolomite series. So again, trying to build landscapes out of these crystal pieces. So I was making a crystal, you know, one of these like individual sculptures as you see this one looks like an individual sculpture. I make it as a strong sculpture that can uh, stand on its own. And then I started making more and then I started putting them together. And then it started to make a landscape. And then I started putting more and more together. And then it actually to me, again, in an abstract way, started to look like mountains. So here's the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, also these landscapes uh, look like cities, of course. They, they started to look like cities. So here's, this is my view of the Blue Ridge, but also look almost like a Chicago skyline. So this is, is, is one of the grouping, and this is my, what I'm currently exploring, more, more groups like these and different colors and different uh, forms. Uh, this is just a view of me setting it up, just to give you a little bit of a, 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 a idea of scale. This is a gold group. Uh, this gold color is just amazing. Um, again, talking about being in my studio and getting to be around a lot of really beautiful glass. I really love this gold color. So this is Crystal City, which is currently a Habitat. This is the largest one. I think there was 23 different individual pieces. These are masterpieces. Thank you. Uh, this is another new series. Exploration of new ideas is re really what drives me. Um, I really like to explore new things. This is furnace glass. So this is glass actually made um, straight out of a furnace. Uh, I had hired a team of, of people to help me, Pablo Soto. If you guys know Pablo, he's a really uh, great artist on his own. Um, I had him help me make these out of the furnace. These are actually quite large and when they're on the end of the blowpipe, they're really hard to work with. So the block or the piece was made first and then I cut and carved um, my techniques. This one, if you see right here, this is actually a bubble and so it reflects the top and bottom through this bubble. Uh, I thought it really, as you were walking around, it has a whole lot of movement um, and I really enjoy these pieces. Here's, here's the nest piece. And again, I showed you this one a little bit in the video, but these things are really great for uh, being somewhere where you can walk all the way around them. It's really hard to find one angle that's the front because it looks interesting. I mean, it's it's around, you know, or they're egg shapes. And so walking around, they're really uh, is the best way to view them. Uh, this is another piece. Um, you remember the first piece that um, was in the Habitat show, the little clear white piece. This is uh, almost like an homage to that. And I didn't even really think about it until I was putting this talk together. So this to me is almost like butterflies. And again, as you walk around it, the colors change and move and can continue to evolve but you can see the proximity how i put the pieces close together really um i think enriches the sculpture itself in the space this is another one that looks really good when you can walk all the way around it uh, this is some of my newest um i guess you would call it corona work so uh, these are some stacked pieces that i were doing so i was stacking pieces together um and i i've done all these during during the time of covid other 
And these were in the videos briefly. And I also made a glass table. Uh, there's uh, in our, which it, we're not going to have it much longer, but in our office, we had this, you know, fairly unattractive TV table. And I was like, I've always wanted to make like a custom table that would fit perfectly. Um, it works better and you can see there's a little place for the cords and everything. So I was able to design and make this whole table during COVID too, which was, um, I'm always for some reason a little weary to do stuff for myself, but I was really excited to make this table and then have ideas like, oh, I can make a coffee table now. And I'm gonna make a countertop <laughs> and I'm gonna make a dining room table and I'm gonna make chairs and everything that doesn't go with it. So um, I haven't done that yet, but I was pretty happy to um, be able to make this and it actually functions very well in our house right now. Uh, this is another piece that I've made during this time, which is a little bit more similar to uh, previous work. So this, I'm going to kind of have a lot of images here, and I know we only have four minutes left, but I'm just going to roll through some of these. Take your time, Alex. Take your time. Okay. I mean, this uh, could be a good time if there's questions that people have. So I'm just going to kind of roll through these. Just, just these are some large pieces that are... Um, at Habitat Alex. as well. Yes. Alex. Yes. It's Malcolm. Um, the, the clear glass, almost optical glass um, with the uh, different images that are built into the glass. Um, are they, yeah, the, is that a, that, yeah. Yes. Is that a one piece or have you done this all, all in one piece or are, are these uh, two separate where you've modularly put them together? Well, this piece here is sitting on a steel base and I'm not sure if you saw the video, I made like a freestanding so it could be in the center of a room or in a corner somewhere. Um, but other right. than that, then the inside, this part is actually a bubble. So this is uh, the outside and then this is the inside and it's reflecting this. So mm. this, this, uh, do you see this peak here? It's reflecting on this inside yeah. bubble that's here. So it really has, there's, you know, a lot of information, a lot of things happening, a lot of things going on with these. Um, does that answer how, your question? How tall, is the, how tall is the piece above the pedestal? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm not totally sure, but I want to say, do you have the dimensions, Aaron? I do. I it's 13 inches tall. Yeah, I was going to say, um, it probably weighs, you know, about 30 something pounds. Like I said, when it's on the end of a blowpipe, when it's 2000 degrees, it feels like it's huge. <laughs> and it is a fairly large yeah. piece of glass, but uh, the, it's, it's more the, the roundness. Um, it's really amazing as you walk around it. Um, it's something that but I would like to explore an, more. It, What's that? The pedestal's an integral part of the piece. No, I made the pedestal as a example of how it could be displayed. And honestly, my wife walked in and said, I don't really like the pedestal, but I love the piece. <laughs> So um, I would disagree. I, I like the pedestal, um, but but it's mm -hmm. the piece is, is just the glass part is the piece. It could be on a you know coffee table or on a shelf or wherever. Um, I like the idea of having it freestanding. I had an idea of having a whole show with these, and they would all be on different size bases. Um, I have probably an image. Alex, it's it. been fascinating watching you over the last 15 years. Your work has just evolved and evolved. It's magnificent. And the, Thank you so and, much. And the, uh, the, the stories of, as to your, 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 your mind seeing a picture and then going and reproducing it in glass is phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really, um, I feel super, super lucky. I really, really love what I do. Um, I mean, not just like it. I love what I do. And I wake up when things are going well. Sometimes it's not a good day in the office and not a good day in my studio. And I just want need to get out and don't need to be there. Um, but mostly when things are going well, there's really not a, a lot of places I'd rather be than inside my studio using my hands to explore new ideas and make new work. I really feel super lucky. And thank you to you guys all for making uh, me able to have a career in doing something that I love to do. I mean, that's not lost on me. I feel really, really lucky to be able to do something I love. I got a question for you, Alex, from the, sure. uh, do you photograph your own work? I don't. Um, and actually going back to this COVID, I guess technically these images, I sort of did. Uh, Dan Fox, who is a photographer that Habitat's been using. Um, and if anyone needs their collections photographed, he's really great. This image was a cell phone picture that I sent him from my phone 
and then he dropped it into this background. Does that make sense? So it's basically like all these were cell phone images and then he drops them into um, the backgrounds and makes them look professional. And I would do two shots. I would shoot with a lot of light going through and then I would shoot just to get the texture. Um, but that's another thing that I've evolved and changed um, during the time of COVID is <laughs> I'm not, um, not going to the photographer. Max has asthma and, and as I've talked about him, other, other health issues. So we're obviously taking COVID very seriously and want to be really, really strict. So going, even going to my photographers is something I'm not comfortable with. But the fact that I can email my, this guy, Dan Fox in Seattle images, and then he can make them professional. Um, this is going back to my traditional photography. This is a half moon. I just put some of some pieces that I like in this group in here. Those are larger, like 36 inches tall, right? The, uh, These are, I think, 52 inches 52. tall. 52, wow, that's massive. Yeah, I really, wow. I like these, especially this is my favorite color. I think there are some of my more elegant pieces as far as the form. It's almost like a portal here. Yeah. Here's just a close up of a, a triptych. And so again, with the dolomite pieces, grouping. This was another one that I made recently, COVID. So I really liked how these colors evolved. I mean, there's a, quite a variety of, of works uh, you have. We have them at the gallery too. I'd love to be able to uh, show people what's available. So we'll talk more and put out a newsletter for people to enjoy and see what is available in your studio and at the gallery. Great. There's some, I can just watch these all day. They're amazing. Yeah, I mean, we're, I think this is maybe the last one. Are there any other questions? This has been really fun. Alex, the three-piece dolomite that you just showed, those magnificent colors, yeah. how tall are each of the pieces? Uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think this, um, <laughs> the tallest, I believe, is around 24 inches, is my guess. Okay. Uh, but I've, you know, made, made lots of different varieties. So this is actually bullseye glass. So it's uh, the, um, the colors, again, they're all hand mixed. Actually, in these, there's two different colors that mix. I don't know if you can tell, but there's an inside color and an outside color. I really wanted them to almost have this inside energy that kind of glows um, from, from inside. Any other questions? So Alex, the serpentine piece, the 52 inch tall piece, are you casting that in that rough shape or are you carving it out of something solid? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, originally, like the, the how to or the videos where I was showing you where I was really sculpting every bit of the shape. Um, nowadays, I still do that, but not quite. Uh, so you, to answer your question, this shape is uh, mostly there or partly there in the oven. And then I carve and refine it and sculpt it. So I'm not doing as much subtractive sculpting on these. I still do some, but, but not as much these. Um, and I was actually really happy that I designed these two fit inside each other inside my oven, like the negative space and the other negative space, they actually fit perfectly to fit inside my oven to maximize how much uh, to try to save energy and, and maximize the space in my oven. And, and it actually was no, no small task to try to get them to fit. <laughs> then the follow up, the ones with the circle in the center that is open, is that cast as a circle in the center or do you carving like, like These? Right, that right there? Are you casting that circle or? or are you uh, that out? Most of them are full circles. Some of them are like this. It depends. You can see from this and I really like how, um, see this color of blue here? it actually is just a little bit right here. So they actually, there these two were joined. So you can see this color was mixed into this. And I like that, um, that there's, let's see if I'm finding that. Um, I like how there's a memory. Uh, this one wasn't, but, but in some of the, the newer stuff, um, it's a full circle and then I cut it apart. And, and I like that you can see where the different colors mix. And you say full circle, you mean as a donut or are you casting it as a solid uh, disc? Uh, a little bit of both, but, but probably this one was more like a donut. It probably almost came together in the middle, but there was probably a little bit of hole. And then this is cut and then ground to get it, you know, whatever shape. And this actually is not that, um, not that easy to do. It's a little tricky to get this inside curve just perfect and just exactly how I want it. And there's, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of tricks that I do to, to, to get it that way. Uh, this one, I think, was just a teardrop, and then again, I, I kind of cut this, cut this in. 
I don't see if anything else. Yeah, these two are connected. You can almost see where I kind of cut them apart to open it up, which again is a little bit tricky. This one I think was was a half like that. Any other questions? You know, questions about the steel? Everybody understand the burn staining? You got it. Everybody got it now. That's great. <laughs> Absolutely great. Well, thank you, Alex. This has been an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot about your work and what inspires you. And I'm uh, again, I'm, thank everybody for joining me. Thank you personally, everybody, for coming and joining us today and uh, experiencing Alex. Alex, the piece you did for Nancy and I lights up our day every oh, day. I'm so happy. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's the kind that of, means a lot. Hey, yeah. Alex, yes. how much of, how much of, how much of the polishing and grinding do you do yourself versus your assistant? I do it 100% by myself now during the time of COVID. <laughs> there used to be a time where I had two assistants. Uh, they were both part-time, uh, but I, um, most days I would have somebody that came in to help for about four hours a day, and I would have them do uh, some of the kind of manual labor, or just manual labor, excuse me, um, now, uh, because of COVID, I've basically been working by myself. So 100% from the making the oven, I'm making the molds, doing, I've been doing everything. And my production of producing work has been, um, it's slow in the making. And it's definitely frustrating to have it go so slow. But, um, but it is being in control of the entire process is, is in a way nice. Um, but it was um, it's definitely challenging. <laughs> And the, the people that work for me, I want to say that are great people. Actually, Ben is getting married today. One of my long time, he worked for me for about six years. Um, and it just with COVID, it felt uh, not, not safe to be there. And uh, it just didn't work out. And they just decided to uh, find other things. And actually, both my assistants now have their own glass blowing studios. They took um, the unemployment payments and used mm -hmm. those wisely. And actually, both of them built... Um, their own glass blowing studios. They both blow glass in their garages. So both of them are doing a great job. That's great. Someone is drawing on your presentation. I'm not sure I know, how that's I see happening. That. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> really uh, any other questions? So um, Alex, I see a, a lot of pieces that we had not seen of yours before. Could, mm -hmm. could you coordinate with Aaron and send out some kind of a recap of available works at your studio and that is that Habitat? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Great. Yeah, and that's like I, I'm so glad that people could could uh, be here for this talk because um, in today's day and age, um, it used to be American Craft Magazine or Glass Magazine. You would have an ad, or I'd do postcards, and people would find out about my work through postcards, through magazines, or through mail mailings that the gallery would do. Now with the internet and and things have changed and um, I don't know who's familiar with my work and who's not. And so it, it's a little, it is a little hard to keep up with. And that's why I was really happy that Aaron and Corey asked me to do this. Um, Cause I do make a lot of work and there are different things. And if you, I don't expect everybody to keep up with it, but this is a good way to, to do that. And um, we actually uh, intended to put something together and are working on it this afternoon. We're going to put um, Aaron, what was it called? A, um, uh, we're gonna put out a newsletter with some available pieces and give people the content of uh, what's in what you have available and we do too. Right. So okay. We'll get on top of that. Sure. Uh, another question: uh, Any advice you have on opening your own studio? Oh, um, jump, before you answer, let me jump in here. Jump this. Yes. Next week we have Janusz Janusz Walentinowicz, part of Habitat Now for next Saturday. We'll be in touch with timing on that. Alex, mm -hmm. feel free to stop sharing and uh, we okay. can see each other again. Let's see. Stop sharing. And then you can answer that question. Check there you go. Hi, everybody. Now I can see everyone. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any more questions if people have other questions. Hi, everyone. About uh, thank you again. It's really, it's really you, nice Alex. to see. It's so nice it to see people's fun. faces. I've, I've definitely felt very, very lonely. Um, <laughs> just, just doing our work and trying to do this remodel of our house and do. Um, I really miss all these events. I miss SOFA, I miss seeing everyone. So it's nice to see you all virtually. And I hope that we can um, break bread together sometime soon. 
Well, great guys. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. And uh, thank you again, Alex, for being here and exploring uh, your entire career with us. I really learned a lot. Well, thank you again and be well, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Bye. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Bye, guys. Normal job. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.